like to call to order the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees public hearing for proposed 2022 tax levy for the Village of Riverside and the Riverside Public Library, Thursday, October 20th, 2022. Ethan, please call the roll. President Ballerin. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Galagos. Here. Trustee Clarity. Here. Trustee Marshaska. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Mars. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Soul. Thank you. Uh, acknowledgement of the public, publication of the public hearing notice. Ms. Jans. Good evening. Tonight is the public hearing for the 2022 property tax levy for the Village of Riverside and the Riverside Public Library to be collected in 2023 and years after that. The estimate of the 2022 property tax levies, which are, are being announced pursuant to state law at the October 4th, 2022 budget, I'm sorry. Um, the 2022 property tax levy for the Village and Library consists of 7,419,000 $865 for corporate special, special and police pension purposes and $729,728 for debt service net of abatements for a total net village and library levy of $8,149,592. This notice appeared last Wednesday, October 12th in the Wednesday Journal. Thank you. The 2022 tax levy presentation? I'm sorry, that was the presentation. That wasn't, okay. <laughs> uh, that was the acknowledgement. Um, is there any questions or comments from the public? Okay, hearing none. Um, uh, Council. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Karen, could you go over the proposed increases? Oh, absolutely. We have to call those out. I'm sorry. The, the corporate and special purpose property tax levies are estimated to be extended or abated for 2021 are $6,857,564. The proposed 2022 taxes le levied for those purposes are $7,419,865. This represents an 8.2% increase over the previous year. The property tax estimated to be extended for debt service and public building commission leases in 2021 are 762,197. The estimated property tax levied in a, for debt service and public commissions le leases for 2022 are 729,728, representing a 4.26% decrease over the previous year. This equates to a total property tax levy to be extended or abated in 2021 of 7,619,761, and the estimate extended to be levied and abated in 2022 of 8,149,592. This represents a total 6.95% increase. Thank you. With that added information, is there any? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, one more uh, required piece of information. If you could just briefly explain uh, why Detail. the increase. OK. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, this year's um, CPI was 7%. However, the property taxes for non-home rural communities are um, capped at a 5% increase. This levy is expected to we have levied more than that. We expect the county to cut us off at the amount of new property to be estimated approximately at 5%. Thank you. With that being said, is there any comments from the public or from our lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, if none, uh, if I can ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Trustee Gallego, second. I'll second. Second by Trustee Evans. Ethan, would you please call the roll? Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshazga. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Let's see if we can get this one a little better. 
Sorry about um, that. I'd like to call to order the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees public hearing on proposed budget for fiscal year 2023. Ethan, if you'd please call the roll. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshazka. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. President Ballerine. Aye. Village Manager Francis. Yes. Village Attorney Mars. Yep. Also present Village Clerk Silver. Thank you. Ms. Johns. Good evening again. We are required by state statute to have a public hearing for the 2023 budget before adoption. This no notice of this meeting appeared in the October 12th, October 12th, 2022 edition of the Wednesday Journal. The draft budget has been available for public review at the front desk of Village Hall since October 12th. The annual budget doc document um, provided to you tonight um, in draft form has the total 2023 budgeted revenues and transfers for all of the village funds of $21,157,579. The total 2023 budgeted expenditures and transfers out for all village funds are $25,179,980. The 2023 budgeted revenues and transfers in for all Riverside Public Library funds are $1,468,947. The total estimated budgeted expenditures and transfers out for all library funds are $1,451,500. A draft copy of the ordinance is also provided in your packet tonight. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions or comments from the public? Is there any questions and comments from any of the trustees? Okay. Hearing none, if I can have a motion and a second. So moved. Motion by Trustee Gallagher, second. I'll second. Second by Trustee Evans. Ethan, if you please. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries, thank you. Um, I'd like to call to order the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting, Thursday, October 20th, 2022. If we can all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ethan, just in case anyone's left, please call the roll. <laughs> Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Galagos. Here. Trustee Clarity. Here. Trustee Nysazga. Here. Trustee mm -hmm. Hannon. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. President Ballerine. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Mars. Here. Also present Village Clerk Soul. Thank you. First on our uh, uh, agenda tonight is the President's report, and I do not have a report. So I will pass it on to the manager's report, Ms. Francis. Thank you, I just have one quick item. I just wanted to thank Director Malchiotti and um, the Parks and Rec team, in addition to the police department for a spectacular Halloween event last night. Thank you so much. That is all I have. Thank you. Um, is there any uh, comments or uh, from the residents on non-agenda items? Okay. Hearing none, we will move on to the consent agenda. Ethan, if you would, please. Approve voucher list of bills, October 20th, 2022. Review and file finance, August monthly report. Review and file community development and public works, September monthly reports. Review and file quarterly purchase order report. Approve village board of trustees, regular meeting minutes, October 6th, 2022. Review and file Landscape Advisory Commission regular meeting minutes, September 13th, 2022. Review and file Preservation Commission regular meeting minutes, August 11th, 2022. Review and file Historical Commission regular meeting minutes, September 19th, 2022. Review and file Riverside TV Commission regular meeting minutes, August 8th, 2022 and September 12th, 2022. A resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a supplemental statement of work contract with municipal GIS partners for a not to exceed amount of 44,550 for 2023 geographic information system services. 
a resolution determining the estimated Village of Riverside real estate tax levy for the year 2022. Thank you. Do any trustees would like any of these items removed? Okay. Hearing none, uh, I would ask for a motion and a second, please. So moved. Motion by Trustee Malagos. Second. I'll second. Second by Trustee Evans. Ethan, if you please. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we move on to the department, board, and commission reports. Uh, first on the agenda is an update of, on body warm camera information, Director Buckley and Commander Coder. Good evening, President Sells, members of the Village Board, and Village Manager Francis. I'm sorry. It's President okay. Bellarine. <laughs> I saw Jill as soon as I walked up. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, inviting us here to talk a little bit tonight about body worn cameras. Um, Riverside is well ahead of the game. And what I mean by that is by statute, we're mandated to have them by January 1st of 2025. Uh, but we are at that point because of our population is how they, they base that. So we are ahead of the game because we received delivery of these body worn cameras a few months ago. And we have currently implemented them for all police officers who are working here in the village of Riverside. Um, Commander Coder took on this project. Uh, Actually, it was a while ago, probably over a year and a half ago, when he took this on and said that, you know, let's start moving forward on this because we're going to have to do it. And we did. And with the help of the village manager and the village board, we were able to get it funded, which was a big part of it. Um, you know, and we both feel very strongly, and the whole police department feels very strongly about these. Uh, we are definitely in favor of them. And I actually wore my vest tonight with my camera on. I'll actually pass the camera around so everybody can take a look at it as Commander Coder's talking. Um, when Commander Coder takes over these projects, the one part he loves about it is to come here and address the village board and tell them about the whole project <laughs> and what it does. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring up Commander Coder so he can talk about it. And then if there's any questions at the end, we're more than happy to answer them, so. So just a quick update. Um, like the director said, uh, we took on this project last December, asked the board uh, to approve the project and ordered on January 1st um, through Axon. Uh, they, like everything else, they didn't come in until around June. Uh, we trained up all our, all our staff and administration. Uh, shortly after that, Axon came out. We got everybody initiated um, with, the, with the training by August. Uh, like he said, every officer in the police department from the director on down is operating with a body-worn camera to this date. Um, what that means is basically state law requires us, any call we go on, you have to activate the body camera, so that's kind of our policy. Currently, the only time we're not uh, wearing it is for community activities, like if we're out there directing traffic at the schools or just a, a contact with person, every, a contact with a, just a regular person out there that has nothing to do with police work. Um, we're not activating the body cameras. Some of the nice things uh, that have occurred already are, I mean, the body cameras are not, other than being a body-worn camera, the cameras are not new to Riverside police officers. We have been operating for over 20 years with in-car in -car cameras since they came out and body-worn microphones, so this isn't a big, a big thing to the officers of Village of Riverside. Um, a couple nice things though are the surrounding agencies, which makes it easy for us. Out of the West Central Dispatch, there are four agencies that they dispatch for. Three of those are all on acts on body cameras, which give dispatch the ability to um, GPS us. It has a GPS feature that they can look up for, safe, for safety for our officers if they're not answering the radio or something. They can activate the body cam and see actually where we're at. Um, and then, uh, like I said, a couple things that are really nice that we've seen so far is um, just the community, uh, community caretaking function, just working with these cameras and seeing our officers out there. We're not, like I said, we're not having any issues with them right now. Their attitudes towards them are great. And like I said, we've been operating with cameras forever. Um, improved audio and video capabilities. These cameras are unbelievable. The, like the uh, video we're getting back, we just had two of our officers involved in a fire in North Riverside the other night. We were able to go through it and kind of see what was going on and it was pretty intense to watch the video as they uh, responded to the call. Um, again, improved officer safety and situational awareness with the GPS and some of the other capabilities of the camera. And the system allows for us to tag the videos at a, a much better um, like logging rate than our old Panasonic videos did. And then some of the huge um, features of this product are what they call signal technology. So any 
Um, again, it is new, but in the height of something going on, like a car chase or somebody just taking off on you, the last thing you do is want to tap your chest twice, you know, a month into this program. So um, some of the huge features are anytime we activate the lights in our cars, um, the cameras will automatically go on. So you don't have to remember that. Um, if you ever pull your taser out of the holster and engage, not even pull the trigger, just engage it, turning it on, the cameras automatically go on. And then if uh, the director or any other officer was on a call, already engaged in the call, and uh, the camera was already rolling, then anybody else who's a Riverside officer who comes in automatically activates your camera knowing that that camera's already working. So every officer on scene is automatically tagged and everybody's, all the cameras are working on the scene. Give me one second. When Leo said tap your chest twice, <laughs> what he meant by that is for us, for me to activate this camera right now, I would have to tap it twice in the center of it, and that's what turns the camera on. So I'm not tapping my chest, I'm actually turning on the camera when I do that. Um, and then to turn it off, we just press and hold it, and it gives us a little beep and lets us know that the camera is off at that time. So watch. That's it. So right now I'm recording and it just recorded 30 seconds prior to me turning or to Leo turning on my camera. So it does pre-record. Um, so if we miss something, you know, something happens right now, I can turn it on real quick and then capture what occurred 30 seconds prior. I'll turn it off if you want to. Nice. <laughs> Um, and then a couple other great things is uh, nationwide 93% uh, decline of citizen complaints against police due to the body cameras being worn and being able to review those actual videos that are taking place on scene. And then an increased transparency and accountability for officers and the public on both sides. So it's, uh, like I said, we're not, we're not getting that much information back because we've only been operating for one month, but we do have everybody in the department operating with the cameras and it's been pretty successful so far. And then the big thing on our side was uh, we put in for a, a grant through Irma and we received $10,000 back to support the program right off the bat for this year. So that was a big, a big help too. Thank Another you. thing about these cameras, you'll see most of us wear it center mass on our chest, on our vest. There are some a little bit lower, but these cameras, their field of view is very wide on both sides, you know, up and down and to the side, so it covers a very good field of vision around us. They're very clear. Uh, the sound on them, it had several microphones built into it. Uh, so the sound that it captures is also very good. Um, definitely a, an asset to our department. Um, Commander Coder worked very hard putting this together. We still have a little ways to go. We're working on some different storage things uh, for storing the videos um, and how we're actually for court preparing them for court because there's times our videos are 45 minutes long and trying to put those onto either a thumb drive or a disc uh, has been a little bit of a challenge. So we're working on some of those things also, but we are ahead of the game. Uh, we will continue to work with this program and make it better um, and work with our neighbors also because they're also using the same system that we are and it does help having us all working together um, under that system. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. I, I had no idea that they were so sophisticated that they can pre-record mm -hmm. or that when you, you take your taser out and it turns on. I, I, I could do that real quick, but <laughs> so I'll point it to the back here. So if I turn my taser on right now, the camera automatically, you hear the camera go beep, beep. It just went on. So now it is on and recorded. So it recorded 30 seconds prior. So I got your question on video. <laughs> um, and then once again, to turn it off, I have to actually manually turn it off, hold it for t uh, three seconds, and then it turns itself off. And so does it, does it do data collection? It just keeps, do you keep the data oh, yes. in that, or do you so download it somewhere? It also just captured that I turned my taser on, and that, that data is also captured. How long it was turned on for, um, and what I did with it, meaning that I actually activate it, or um, that I turn it on and turn it off and it'll show all of that also. Or if you pulled the trigger or if you just spark, like if you just arc it, what they call it, like you just show electrical current on the front or you pull the trigger, it records everything you do with that device. I meant the data. Then it data records it and saves it, saves it to the cloud currently. We have unlimited oh, storage. Okay. Yeah, we have unlimited storage at this point because we knew how important this was gonna be. Um, I mean, we're seeing like some officers are running their cameras on 96 <coughs> minutes on some of these calls and, and that's just crushing like our computers right now trying to send out this information. The only nice thing about Axon is we have the feature, the best part was going with the state's attorneys and trying to send some of these cases. We can, it's cloud-based so they can just open up a file at their desk instead of making all these old copies or, you know, on CD. 
we're, we would make 11 CDs for just one incident sometimes. So, yeah, it's been... The technology is yeah. wonderful. Yeah. It really does help a lot. Sounds like it. Good job. Thank you. Any other yes. questions? Yep. <laughs> Do you use it for, or would you anticipate using it for officer training, or is this purely just to have a record of what goes on in the field? So currently we have two officers that are in the field training program, so yes, they are utilizing the cameras while they're in their training program, so we can review how, the, how they're performing on different, because um, they're out there on the street right now. So they're still in training, and so we do review a lot of their, uh, their calls that they go on, um, but that's also being done by the field training officer that they're with. Uh, we haven't necessarily used it for in-house training yet, but we are still looking at um, utilizing for that also. Can you, can you sit in your desk and activate Commander Coders? Um, no. But if his is activated, can you see it from a computer? <coughs> can, do you have a live feed you, you, to, so to what's going there, on? There is a way to do that. Um, we don't have that set up yet. I can look at my phone and see where he's at on our GPS map. Uh, but the live feed we don't have uh, set up yet. It is something we can do if the camera is activated. Okay. So it's basically always on. Because if you're recording 30 seconds before you touch the button, it's, it's always got, recording. Yeah. It's always it buffers recording. back 30 and seconds. Then it, and it just keep, keeps kicking back. And, that's cool. right. and I'm sure you can understand about that live feed, but most people around the area, we were just kind of following, are super freaked out about that being able to Oh, like go into their cameras at all times. So for the initial, we went with this phase, taking that out, just letting them know, hey, this is, we're not trying to like spy on you 24 hours a day. But even if you were to go on the camera, it beeps letting you know somebody's now on the camera. Like it, you can't just go silently on the camera, but if you were to like um, go into the live feed, it lets you know somebody's now like watching what you're doing and triggers like an activation letting you know that. Well, the, the reason for the question is when you brought up the fire, if you know, the a commander is sitting in his office and something's going on, you'd be able to actually see live what was going on. That's, that was the question. But yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Thank, thank you, you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other reports this evening? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to pending business. A resolution authorizing the village manager to waive competitive bidding and issue a purchase order not to exceed the amount of $87,541.04 to Sherwin Industries for the purchase of a road crack ceiling trailer. Director Tab. Good evening, everyone. Annually, the village spends um, the appropriate money to have contractual services do crack ceiling throughout the village. And basically, what that is is the installation of adhesive sealant into the cracks to prevent water from permeating the roadway and thus uh, <laughs> freeze thaw cycle, it, it deteriorates the roadway uh, prematurely. So annually, the village contracts out for this service. This year we had appropriated $55,000. Next year we would have appropriated $35,000. Uh, what I'm proposing is the purchase of the machine to do that, that work um, in-house. So basically, uh, the cost would be covered for the machine over the next two years, taking the allocation this year in conjunction with what we would have proposed next year, um, deducting the material expense basically equates to the purchase price of the machine over a two-year period. Uh, we've done similar efforts with our thermoplastic striping in town. We purchased that machine this year, and we've already paid for the machine um, in less than a year with what we were able to accomplish uh, in-house. When I brought this up during the CIP discussion a few meetings ago, there was concern that we did have enough staff uh, internally to accomplish this. Uh, since then, the board did approve two additional employees for the Public Works Department, which I appreciate, so thank you very much. Um, but we will be utilizing those additional employees to take on this, this task in-house and accomplish it, and thus saving money starting in 24, we'd save approximately $30,000 a year by doing it in-house. What's the life expectancy of the <coughs> uh, I would estimate about 15 years 
We had a, a demo recently that was a rental, which those are beat out all the time. And that one was 12 years old and still in working, good working condition. We would, of course, take a lot better care of it than a rental company. So minimum of 15 years I'm anticipating. <laughs> and I'm just curious, I'm, you have to buy some sort of ceiling material, right? That's available right. to us and at reasonable cost and yes. you know how to handle it. It's not We're estimating $5,000 a year for the material to do uh, a similar quantity that we would do contractually. Now, if we feel that we can accomplish more, great. We'll purchase more and we'll budget uh, moving forward for more material, but I don't want to set the expectation too high until we can. Uh, we definitely want to meet the, uh, the similar quantities that we would do contractually, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, I would, of course, like to do more than less, and if we can accomplish that internally, we'll definitely do that. If anyone has any questions other than that. More than any other questions? Hearing none, if I can have a, a motion and a second. So moved. Motion by Trustee Gallagos, second? Second. Second by Trustee Marsazga. Um, Ethan, if you please call the roll. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marsazga. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries, thank you. We, we move on to our continuing discussion of the TOD. Um, I will remind everybody that again, we are, this is a, a big project. Uh, it took several years to get us to this far, so we're not expecting to be done um, in the next couple of weeks. So um, um, let's, we'll go over everything, mark down your questions, we'll, we'll, we'll ask them, we'll, we'll get it done, and then we'll, we'll review everything as we move on. So we will uh, move on to Ms. Monroe, and thank you for this document. It was very, very easy to, uh, to look through, so I appreciate your hard work on that. Well, and thank you for Trustee Hannon for proposing it. Well, th th <laughs> thank you for putting this together. It was exceeded my expectations in being helpful to understand what we were looking at. So I appreciate you echoing President Valerie. I really appreciate that. We certainly will, uh, throughout the course of this, if we can prepare the same sort of document for the other pieces that we've already presented, that's the plan. So I'm glad it's working for you and we can move on from there. Um, so good evening. This is the third time I'm speaking before you about this particular issue. So we are looking at making changes and updates to the, the Village of Riverside Zoning Ordinance, so chapter 10 of our code. And um, as President Ballerine had explained, we're not making any uh, final decisions this evening, although uh, your feedback and comments and questions are going to be put forward into any changes we need to make to the document uh, ordinances. So um, you have this item as page 131 of the packet. Uh, there's a short memo which alludes to just the general history of this item, right? We received a grant years ago. Uh, we've been working through this process for the last couple of years, and as such, we've brought uh, various proposed changes based on a steering committee's recommendations to the Planning and Zoning Commission at several public hearings. So what we've provided to you tonight is from the July 22nd public hearing. Um, so this was the third uh, iteration of, of a section of the code and changes. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission on that day did approve six to zero uh, recommended changes, and I will walk through um, those for you um, at your you know, discretion. Uh, page 134 of the packet is the actual ordinance draft. Um, I will note that there was a correction made in the chart that you have before you. The reason it's printed before you is that um, we mistakenly left out uh, permitted use for two items, um, one on page eight of the chart and page nine of the chart for various um, adult use cannabis dispensary and a medical cannabis dispensary uses in the B1 TOD 
uh, proposed zoning district. So I just wanted to draw attention to why you have it in front of you, in addition to hopefully making it easier to walk through some of these proposed changes. So um, last memo had described in very various bullet points, we thought maybe it would be easier to as uh, Trustee Hannon had suggested, make a chart that walks through and shows you both the existing sections of code and the proposed changes that pertain to those sections. Um, would you like me to, to walk through these various items in, in brief detail and then you can ask questions or would you like to ask questions of, of us about what's proposed? I, I think a, if you can give an overview of Great. the changes, that'd be helpful. Wonderful. We're at least focused. Okay. Um, so we have uh, 1031, it starts on 1031, establishment of zoning districts. Um, we have existing zoning districts. Uh, we have, the existing code doesn't specify the sub-districts within the business, um, business districts and residential to some extent. So what we've done is just created in greater detail, um, refining the, the definitions for our existing zoning. Table two, that's the next section of the chart. Table two in residential districts and permitted uses um, creates a special use for assisted living facilities in R2, R3, and R4. And so that would expand the districts in which an assisted living facility could be developed but it also requires additional review if such a use would be to proposed. Um, and we also have talked at prior meeting about both assisted living facilities and independent living facilities being something that we'd revisit with uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, the next piece addresses the same for independent living. We've removed the term elderly, it's just outdated and so we, we took that into account. Table two of our residential districts permitted uses removes the modifier of professional from office. Uh, the next part of this uh, updates that same table to include electric vehicle charging stations as a permitted use in all residential districts. It refers to a new subsection 10810, which describes uh, the standards for electric vehicle charging. Just for reference and easy, uh, easy things to follow, uh, we included that in the chart, so just below there. So we've incorporated a brand new section talking about where to locate electric vehicle charging stations in both residential and business districts, and it also includes uh, standards for how we would cite public zone uh, electric charging stations. So it hits on uh, both you know, private use, so allowing people to put this on their private property within their garage or on their otherwise on their property. It identifies ways that the commercial uses can be applied, so, you know, locating it in an area that's directly connected to their property. They're not crossing over property in order to access utilities. Um, the village would be allowed to do that, so if there's a stretch of, of property in a right of way that we need to cross to to connect to a utility, we would be allowed to do so. And then, uh, let's see. And we will also allow the electric vehicle charging station as a kind of a um, part of a gas station or motor vehicle station, right? So if it's not the primary use of a facility, allowing the transition potentially from a gas station to um, a place where you can charge electric vehicles. So that's the, that's the new uh, section. We have 1052, which addresses B1 business district standards. This makes minor changes to incorporate not the two existing business sub-districts. So right now we have a B1C, which is a commercial, and a B1TC. Uh, we, with the incorporation of a third sub-district, would need to also change the section to accommodate uh, the new sub-district. Uh, it also notes in these sections the definitions. 
Kind of, we're looking at, again, thinking about transit-oriented development. So when we're talking about TOD, it's just that. Um, and we want to incorporate this sort of feel of mixed use, um, multimodal, lots of transit access, walkable areas. That's, a, that's kind of the landmark of TOD districting. Table four of our business district has a permitted uses. It adds a column for B1 TOD subdistrict. I included a map in your chart identifying exactly where this uh, proposed subdistrict would be, so you have a reference for the rest of the document. And essentially, it's the area just north of Addison Road along Harlem, south to north of Lawton Road. So it's approximately 14 properties along Harlem Avenue, and uh, it doesn't extend any farther west than, than just the properties that face uh, Harlem Avenue. Then we broke out the tables of uses, right? So uh, we incorporated, based on recommendations of the Steering Committee and Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, both some changes in the existing subdistrict, so in both B1 and, uh, I'm sorry, B1C, B1TC, and B1TOD, uh, we had to create uses as appropriate for that new subdistrict and made a couple of changes elsewhere. Um, most notably, we have, uh, there's consistency throughout, so assisted living, facilities, dwellings above ground floor, consistent with the other districts. Uh, dwellings at the ground floor are a little bit different. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission identified that they'd like to allow, um, allow for ground level dwellings as, as needed with a special use, but it wouldn't necessarily need to be permitted outright. And, and they break out the, uh, those uses. Above ground floor for dwellings in a business district would be permitted uses. Townhouses would be a special use in both B1C and TOD. They are currently permitted in the, the transitional commercial district. So kind of just the section, um, the only area that is is um, along Burlington Avenue between Harlem and Delaplane, okay? Uh, home occupations, their standard across the board is permitted uses in all three. Independent living would be a special use. We have, as I noted, the uh, commercial uses for adult use cannabis dispensing organizations are permitted in B1C and B1TOD. Uh, there are bed and breakfast establishments continue to be permitted in all districts. Body piercing is only in the B1C district. Brew pubs, craft distilleries, all permitted. Currency exchanges, daycare centers, financial institutions, special uses. They're not currently a use in the transitional commercial. Financial institutions, funeral homes um, are permitted uh, funeral homes are not permitted in the B1 TOD. And a hotel motel is a new addition as a special use in B1C and B1 TOD. Uh, the steering committee recommended this as an option for use. We just hadn't identified it in our code prior. And so this allows us to consider that as a use. There's no change to a junk dealer as a special use in B1, B1C. Uh, the medical cannabis dispensing organization stays a permitted use in B1C and is added as a permitted use in the TOD. Microbreweries are permitted uses throughout. Motor vehicle stations and offices at the ground floor of a single story building are considered special uses um, in this iteration. So we have could, additional could, discussion, could, perhaps. Could, can we just stop there? Yeah. So that means, for example, uh, in the B1C, mm -hmm. you, if, if somebody has a one-story building mm -hmm. and they want to open up a, well, we have several of them. You can't, you can't, you can't, you, 
by this you can't do it. Correct? You have to have a you have to come to get to get um, permission to open up a business if it's in a single story building. If that building is already a single story building. Correct. A, a new business. Yes. That's that's a, okay. That would be a professional business, not a retailer. But if somebody wanted to open up an accounting firm, right? Um, in let's say the bartender school, mm -hmm. he would have that as a special use. Yes, according to the proposed changes. Okay, I just want to make sure that's clear to everyone. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay. President Ballery, yes, sir. Is a clarification yeah. on that. If it's a if it's an existing office use and a new office comes in, mm -hmm. they don't have to go through the special use, do they? Uh, Attorney Mars, we had talked a, a little bit about this and whether there would be a required new process by which they would need to go through zoning even if it had been used in the same way, a doctor's office to a doctor's office, or had we determined that they would be required to go through that same the special use process. I can't, I'll have to go back and look at okay. my notes and, on that. <clears throat> Sorry to ask that question, but it, it was but a question raised. That's something we raised. should make clear yeah. one way or the other, obviously. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask if it would be possible to make it clear in a different way by saying that if um, you know it is a situation where a use of a different type is replaced with an office use, then it becomes and triggers the special use analysis, and otherwise it's permitted. So if you have an office use that's going to become a new office, that it's permitted. But if you so have, if you have, yeah, I mean, can we clarify? So, so if the real estate office becomes an accounting firm, that's right. okay. Right, so that they don't have to go through an extra, you yep. know, hurdle. But if a but if a restaurant turns into an accounting firm, then they need a special use permit yeah. okay. or a special use process. Okay, that's what that, I would prefer. That's, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we do have a same sort of principle: an office at the ground floor of a multi-story building and same principles as a, as a special use. It currently is a special use um, in the B1C and B1TC. Um, we're keeping it consistent in the TOD um, with that, where you can um, do other things above that um, office use. Offices are ground above the ground floor, permitted throughout all three sub-districts. Uh, personal services establishments also permitted. Precious metal dealers is a permitted use in everything but the, the TC consistency across those districts. A special yeah. use would be needed in the B1C. Why, why, why a precious dealer, that's, that's a jeweler store, right, basically? Yeah. Okay, why would we, why was, what was the reasoning for not allowing it in the B1TC? I don't know if it was uh, spoken about directly or, or asked a question during the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I know that it, it currently isn't permitted for whatever reason, but if there's a specific Yeah, user, we'd have to look at the uh, definitions, but I think precious metal dealer might have been intended to be like a cash for gold. Or is it like a... As opposed to a, a retail jewelry store. Not a pawn type. But yeah, a, we should we should tighten that up to make sure we know exactly what we're permitting and not permitting. Right. Okay. Because okay. uh, I, 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 I well, so I'm sorry. Because if sure. that was the case, I think those should be two categories: um, cash for gold and. and well, we have general retail already. So so one of the things your code has these very broad categories like retail, right, or office. And then it's only for specific uses that we want to deal with on an individualized basis that we pull it out. So a regular jewelry store can always just be retail because no one's going to have an issue with where that goes. Anywhere that retail is allowed, we'd want it. Whereas the cash for gold, I think the idea was, okay, we're going to allow those on Harlem Avenue, uh, but we did not want it necessarily um, 
you know, next to the residential or whatever else was okay. in the transitional districts. Okay. Well, Harlem Avenue is next to Rush. I think we should, I, that's one of the things that if we're going to leave that in, this should be a, I think should be a special use. We should have a take a look at that and, and just, that's, that's my thought, but go, move on. Okay. Just make a notation. Okay. Thank you. We talk about restaurants in, in these districts. Uh, one would be a restaurant with drive-through facilities as a special use in the commercial and the TOD subdistricts. Uh, restaurants with outdoor dining it would be permitted throughout. Uh, we also removed the term cafe and just went with dining for a very, you know, you know what eating is. Okay, um, the, in that same section, um, we have added a, uh, a subsection that has specific standards for those outdoor dining facilities, right? So identifying where they can be placed, administratively gives some guidance for making sure that there's adequate walking space for pedestrians. It's adjacent to that, uh, that front area and it minimizes the path between um, where the, the main entrance and the farthest point of the, the dining area is. Anything different than that would require some type of board approval, likely. Um, but, but if somebody's putting it right outside their front door and there's adequate space, this would allow for um, someone to place a reasonable number of, of dining areas without, um, you know, without going through a site plan process through planning and zoning. Restaurants without drive-through facilities re remain permitted throughout. <coughs> Retail sales establishment with a drive-through would require a special use. Um, it's not a permitted use right now in the transitional commercial district. We have retail sales without drive-throughs permitted throughout. Tattoo parlor, the only place it is permitted use is in the B1C. Vacation rentals would remain a special use throughout. We have government and education areas, so government offices remain a special use in those, all three. Uh, professional vocational schools are a special use. It's not a permitted use in TC. That's the same as it is now. Uh, specialized instructional schools was proposed as a permitted use in all districts, and utilities would be a special use in both the B1C and B1TOD. Okay, I, I, I have another question. Yeah. Um, tattoo parlor. I mean, I, they, they're not, you know, they're not biker hangouts anymore. Um, why wouldn't we allow those throughout the business district on Harlem? At least a, as a special use. Mm -hmm. Yes, Doug. I would argue that we do. Uh, personal services establishment is a permitted use in all three districts. Typically, in land use language, personal services includes health care, or I'm sorry, uh, salons, you know, barbershops, uh, things like that, and tattoo parlors have now become, in the parlance of land use language, have are typically categorized as personal services. So then we should remove this, or make it, or make it compatible with the personal use services. Yes. Okay. Which one? Uh, I always go for the broader categories, but that'd be up to staff okay. and the board. We could staff some okay. advice. Sure. Thank you. I would assume that would be also with the body piercing too, right? Would that be okay? Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. I'm just was to see. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so we've got. Um, Recreation, cultural, and entertainment. We've got permitted uses for all kinds of art galleries, artist studios, arts instruction studios. Um, a banquet or conference facility. This is a, a new addition as a special use. The staff and steering committee had determined that this use could open some doors to uh, alternative type uses and uh, as a special use allows some discretion. We have a cultural facility uh, is permitted throughout, which is consistent with the other code. Uh, place of assembly is a special use, and that's consistent with all three districts. Uh, recreation, indoor and outdoor, 
Um, we've added it as a special use to TOD, so it matches the, the B1 commercial. Uh, we have animal shelters remain a, a special use in B1C. There's been no change and no additions. A attached wireless telecommunication facility, so an antenna, um, is a special use in both commercial and TOD. Uh, electric vehicle charging stations are noted as, as in residential districts as a permitted use in all sub-districts. Uh, and it references the new subsection to refer to. Uh, parking lots are special as a principal use or special use um, in B1C, that's consistent. Uh, parking structures with retail uses on the first floor and structured parking behind, below grade, or on upper floors is a special use um, in the TOD as well as B1C. Planned developments are special use in all three sub-districts. We also have small wireless facilities, solar energy systems on the front or corner of building facades, and wireless support structures for small wireless facilities are all special uses and it's consistent across all three. Um, we're just adding the TOD as a category. And then finally, a, a wireless tower um, is a special use in B1C. Um, the commission agreed that that was the only location they felt comfortable um, keeping that special use. We did the same walkthrough with our B2 sub-districts. Any, any other questions about B1? Very good. Um, these uses are very similar in nature to what has been proposed in the B1. Um, we've got special uses for assisted living facility. We did change it from a permitted use to a special use in our mixed use periphery. So when we talk about the B2 subdistrict, it's downtown, right? So we have the B1 district and the B1 TOD, which is along Harlem generally, and then we have um, the B2 is Central Business District area. Um, I'll also note that we talk interchangeably about the TOD code. Um, while we're incorporating all the principles and different things into the code, we, um, we really are talking about, when we talk about the TOD, it's the sub-district on Harlem and the central business district remains the B2 um, zoning. We have community residences um, that are incorporated into the code as a special use or allowed as a special use. It was listed prior in the code, but um, the Planning and Zoning Commission added it as a special use um, and the ability to determine whether we want that in the, the downtown area. We removed elderly housing uh, from talking about dwellings. Uh, there aren't any changes to those uses above the ground floor. We have a special use added for dwellings, multifamily dwelling units on the ground floor, including independent living in the retail core as a special use. All three of these are special uses in the retail core and mixed use periphery, uh, dwelling single family, dwelling two family, and independent living. Office and related uses, we're not making any changes to financial institutions with drive-through facilities, without drive-through facilities. We have removed the term professional from offices, um, and we have added a special use uh, for the retail core, for any offices on the ground floor based on some of that other discussion. We've got no changes to existing uses for bed and breakfast establishments, brew pubs, craft distilleries, daycare centers, and uh, funeral home remains uh, not a permitted use in the downtown. A uh, hotel motel was added as a special use in the retail core uh, to open up a little bit more opportunity or consideration. There are no changes for microbreweries. Uh, motor vehicle stations or gas stations aren't allowed in the downtown area. Uh, personal services establishments are no changes. Restaurants with outdoor dining, we remove the cafe term, uh, remains the same, so permitted. And, and a special use in the mixed use area. 
Other changes, there's no other changes to drive throughs without, sorry, restaurants without drive through facilities, retail establishments, and vacation rentals. No changes to government offices. Schools, elementary or high school, um, has incorporated as a special use. So planning and zoning was unopposed to this as a special use. Uh, very likely the current schools and districts aren't going to be making changes to their facilities or, or borders. There aren't any changes to other pro schools and professional uses, uh, utilities, local or regional. And then all of our art galleries and artist studios are all continue to be permitted. We're adding a special use for banquet or conference facilities. There are no changes to cultural facilities, places of assembly, plazas, parks, public uses, recreation, indoor and outdoor, theaters, and the attached wireless telecommunication antennas uh, remains a special use in our public use zone. We added electric vehicle charging stations as a permitted use with that new subsection. And then the other aspects for related to wireless systems, solar energy, and other towers are all special uses. They remain so. OK, we have, we have our bulk tables, which this generated some discussion. I will refer you to some visuals um, in addition to the chart. I created a um, sort of a demonstration of what the bulk in the proposed TOD district along Harlem Avenue could look like. Um, I provided a, a version of this. It's at the back of your chart. Um, I provided a version of this to the Planning and Zoning Commission. At that time, it was just a walkthrough of photos of what it looks like as you go up and down Harlem Avenue. Um, what we've done here tonight is done that same walkthrough from the south end to the north end and incorporated a kind of bulk massing uh, demonstration through these blocks of color. So the orange block in your reference would show the proposed maximum height for um, the bulk in the district. So, for example, we we have the B1C, uh, B1TC, and B1TOD proposed changes in these charts. Um, the maximum building height would be in the TOD um, up to 60 feet, but no more than five stories. Um, Excuse me. What page what? are we on? This is on. Sorry. So. 184. We, we were on page 17, so if you want me to walk through that, so I can do that is first. Is this in the, in the agenda In the chart. Packet? It, it, it's yeah. not. It's in the table chart right in front of you. I'm Got sorry. It. Thank you. It was yes. Yeah. Got okay. It. okay. Okay. Sorry okay. to interrupt. No, no. It's good. Thank you. So... Um, I'll just, I'll just go through the chart. You can look at the pictures and I'll explain. So the minimum lot area for B1C commercial, um, the proposed language is to remove uh, the requirement to have 1,800 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit. Um, the rationale from the Planning and Zoning Commission was that there are other factors and standards that would be um, foreseeably account for concerns about how dense or how large um, a development would be. And so preferred to remove this from all, um, from both B1C and the B1TC. There's no change to the minimum lot width in this uh, sub-district. The minimum facade height it remains 18 feet Although it was mentioned and uh, as a question, if we're creating a minimum height of 24 feet, that we may just remove that should that standard be applied. Can I, can yeah. I ask a question about that? And I, you know, I want to preface this that distinguish this discussion from the discussion in the central business district. Mm -hmm. Yep. What is the rationale for 24 feet in? in the um, B1C area. 
Yeah, uh, well, this was the, I think that they were in the steering committee, an initial staff recommendation, so a year plus ago, thinking about the streetscape and, and what that could look like. Um, we are gathering information about other um, comparable communities to see if there is um, a threshold for which we might want to either match or make simpler in development. Um, the B1C, so should the subdistrict uh, for TOD become a reality, right? And we apply the standards to the middle of Harlem Avenue. Um, there are still two areas of B1C that remain. So up north um, off of Long Common and then down at uh, Ogden in Harlem. And so these standards would apply in those, those areas as well. Jim, understanding your question, there, there are, um, in the packet as well, the maps for existing building height all along this whole stretch of Harlem Avenue. Yeah, and, and that was very helpful. It, it, I guess, and I'd love to hear the comments from other trustees, it's just lost on me on why there's an objective of creating a streetscape on Harlem Avenue. I mean, it's okay. not, typically, I understand for Burlington, you want that streetscape on both sides to create that sort of that sense of density, sense of height. Um, but Harlem, we only control one side of Harlem, and I've traditionally viewed Harlem as sort of our commercial sales tax economic driver. And, and, and you know, would hate to have to tell, you know, we just told Sherwin Williams, we, we, they're coming in, they've broken ground, I think. You know, would hate to tell them, no, I'm sorry, you can't build your building that you build all over the country, you need to add another 10 feet on top to make it pretty. It, 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 to me, it's, it's creating a business unfriendly environment on Harlem Avenue because that streetscape, I don't, I'm not feeling that it's justified. Okay. okay. Any, any other comments on the height? Mr. Pollack? The, um, I think the steering committee, uh, the steering committee talked about requiring a two story minimum and uh, one of the, um, members of the steering committee who's a commercial broker had indicated that uh, two stories would be a problem for a lot of retail developers, but 24 feet would not be because they would not be required to actually put a usable, habitable space above the, the first floor. They could do parapet walls or whatever. But I think when the steering committee talked about it, we were focused primarily on the TOD, not the B1C. Um, I, I can only speak for myself. I thought, you know, I was thinking more about the TOD, uh, less about what happens north on Harlem. So I could see Trustee Hannon's point about what happens north on Harlem. Uh, but at, at, in the B1 TOD, which has the same recommendation, uh, the 24 feet's important to create a better environment for pedestrians and, and bicyclists, and that's kind of the intent of this uh, code, is to make, create standards that will make for a better environment for pedestrian and, and uh, human-scaled development rather than automobile-scaled. Um, and and that's the 24 feet, which does create public space, it turns a street from an open space to a designed public space, and that's the intent of the 24 feet. But I, I guess that concept's just lost on me. By making a developer build an extra six feet on top of a building creates pedestrian-friendly areas. Can combined, you for me? yeah, sure. sure, combined with uh, the five-foot uh, maximum setback. I, I get the setback. I don't understand the height. Um, well, there's, uh, I could show you graphically, but there's a concept in architecture and urban design that, um, that is you're walking down the street and your peripheral vision is such that if your peripheral vision goes to the sky, it feels like a completely different space than if your peripheral vision goes to a building. And at one story, 
you're going to see right over the top of that building to sky. So it's a more suburban look. I think DuPage County, uh, you know, in, in a suburban environment that's more automobile, designed for automobiles. Uh, with 24 feet or taller, I mean, ideally it'd be even taller, but, uh, but, but we're only talking about the 24 feet, uh, you at least get some enclosure of the streetscape which creates that pedestrian environment, uh, uh, a more comfortable environment for people on bicycles and walking and not in necessarily in cars. That's the rationale behind it. I mean, if the village doesn't value that, uh, it, then get rid of it. I guess it's the question. I mean, it's a, it's a two lane road in each direction plus a lane of parking. So basically six lane road with no street cape to the east. I, I, I mean, I guess, I, like I said, for the commercial business district, I, I get it. You have it on both sides. It creates very walkable, very visually appealing. On Harlem, I, 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 I guess I'm just not, not seeing how affecting one side of the street on a very busy four-lane, very car-driven area, that that's going to make that, by adding six feet on top of the building, is going to make that any more walkable. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, as I said, it, uh, I, I kind of, I, I understand completely what you're talking about when you're talking about Harlem. It's less important there because it is such a wide street, um, and its character is a little bit different. Uh, but Burlington, uh, and I agree I with think, you 100 percent on Burlington. Okay, it's not that my, this. This is the B1C, right, yeah. on Harlem Avenue, and that's what I'm. That's what I'm questioning right now. We're, we're in a complete oh, sure. agreement on the Central Business District. Well, no, I, I said Burlington, not Central Business District. So the so the TOD has the same standard. That's the trend transitional. That's the area on Burlington and Harlem. The B B1 TOD is uh, is is in, includes Burlington. But I think he's talking about Central Business District right. versus Harlem Business. Well, he's kind of going back and forth. The above, so the TOD, as I'm looking at the map, I just don't understand. So there's the, going to be the Sherwin Williams building is on Burlington in the business district. That's already built on. And then we have the, build, the area that the village just bought on the south end of the tracks that's not on Burlington. What, what area are you talking about? Well, just that area on Burlington and Harlem at that's indicated as being B1 TOD. From Addison to Y, or to, yeah. Does not right. include the B1C North. I, I, I'm going east, I'm sorry. I'm going east-west, and I'm looking at the map of, of the B1 TOD. Mm -hmm. And sorry. Trustee Pollard is talking about Burlington, and I'm looking at that intersection of Harlem and Burlington. We already have a development going up there, which is the Sherwin Williams, which is, my understanding, not 24 feet. It's 18 feet. Okay, so that's. So how how far west, beyond west of the Sherwin Williams building, is that going to go? I mean, what are we talking about? That's, how far west the TOD will go? Yeah. That that's the limit, so it okay, wouldn't so go any you, further mean, west. So the property just next door is. Um, currently marked as a well, the parking lot. There's a one-story and a two-story building so just so immediately that's B1T, west of there. That's B1T, right? Correct. Okay. TC. I'm, yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. So the the baby blue area, the B1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that has to be B1, 24 feet. B1T. In, yeah, so I'm in talking, the proposed code, yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, my I, questions are only on the. And I'll, I agree, on the B1T, if we can go for density there, that makes sense. I'm talking about purely Harlem Avenue, okay. which is the TOD mm -hmm. and B1C Correct. north of that. Yes. So I, I just don't understand how, you know, how we make that a 24 feet minimum, given the breadth and scope of Harlem Avenue. Okay. And I, 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 I agree only, only from the fact that I think Harlem and I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, Doug. Um, Harlem is different than, I mean, Harlem has its, its own feeling. It's like, and, and we don't own both sides. Um, it, you know, I've been driving, I've been 
driving up and down Roosevelt Road, up and down Ogden Avenue, and look at all the, the different um, establishments and, and, and restaurants and, and things that they have. And by this code, most of those things wouldn't, you know, I couldn't have a home run in pizza. I couldn't have a Jimmy John's. I couldn't have a, a Starbucks. I couldn't have a, a, a Dunkin' Donuts um, unless we made them build for 24 feet. And I, I just think that we're making, we're making our, our retail core up on Harlem more difficult to develop than, than, than easy to develop. But it's my thought. But go ahead, Doug. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I don't know that we're, that Trustee Hannah and I are necessarily, necessarily disagreeing because, as I said, north of Burlington on Harlem, which he, I stand corrected, that's part of the TOD. I wasn't thinking of that. That I can see keeping the existing code. Um, but Burlington Street, as yes. was mentioned, I think it's more important because that does have an existing streetscape with a narrow, relatively narrow street compared to Harlem. So we're maybe, we're yeah. in agreement. so we're in agreement. We just need to perhaps, if the rest, majority of the board agrees with that, then the direction would be to change that so that that 24 foot standard only applies to the properties on Burlington. So the B1TC. Well, you'd have to adjust the TOD, because right now the TOD includes two properties that are on Burlington. Oh, okay. So okay. you'd have to adjust that. And I disagree so. with that. I think if it's on Harlem, it's in the TOD, and the Burlington streetscape okay. would start west of the TOD. Okay. I, I mean, I think we have Sherwin Williams coming in at 18 feet. Right. I mean, it, it, that. And we don't know what's going on to the south of that, mm -hmm. but that should not be, to me, that's Harlem Avenue. That's not part of the streetscape. And we shouldn't make that, you know, that area, you know, un undevelopable. And, and the other problem that I have, even with the B1C, is there are several lo level low buildings there. I mean, there's a, mm -hmm. a financial firm and there's other firms. Yeah. And on the next page, if, if that financial firm wanted to expand his offices out the back, he couldn't do that without going up to 24 feet. Am I, it, yeah, the, any new additions or redevelopment of existing properties would need to meet the, the code. Joe. Yes. Last time we talked about this, I, I was also against the 24 foot requirement. It's too narrowing, it's too constrictive. So I would agree with what you and Ed are, are pretty much saying. Yeah, I thank, thank you, Trustee Galgos. I say get a consensus and let's move on. Okay. All right. Um, actually, I think why don't we. Um, I think we got a lot more on this. It's 8:15. I think we've 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 chewed up to page 184 or page 17. It depends <laughs> on which which number you're looking at. Yeah. Um, why don't we do some research on the 24 feet? And I mean, I'm, I'm talking about on, on streets like Ogden Avenue mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. streets that are similar to, to Harlem, so we can get a better feel. Um, yeah. And then we'll come back and and attack some of these this, these things at our next meeting. Is, I'll ask a question, is the, um, the visual exhibit that was prepared in showing the proposed versus potential height with a kind of sheer overlay, is that helpful in, in terms of if we see additional information these along other this? Ones here? Yeah. yeah. They were yeah. very helpful. I like the visuals. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Scott. Okay. That was we'll extremely in, helpful. More, we'll more readable. We'll incorporate it in the minutes, but I'll, I'll incorporate um, similar it? techniques for no, no, other types of research. We're one. talking to other communities, too, yeah. about recent developments so that we can figure out if there's something. So um, over a tea branch. No. Actually, I'd like to, as, as, we, as, we, as we pause, um, yeah. I'd like to give you a, 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 a thought, and probably you'd have to talk to legal and whether we can do this because I'm not a not a zoning administrator um, 
as I look at the railscape, uh, and I go from Berwyn to Harlem, and then go from Harlem basically all the way into the end of Riverside on the other side of First Avenue. The railscape on Harlem, or on, in Berwyn, is a railscape down the center with a nice sloping hill with parking and then buildings on the side. Once you enter Riverside, for some reason, along the way, our railscape turned into an alley where it's overgrown, it's multiple different fences, it's, 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 there's a train going up, there's no buffer. I'm wondering if it makes sense to put a, a railscape overlay from Harlem to Delaplane and from Burlington to Quincy, that we allow those businesses to not have to butt up to the, the, the sidewalk, but rather butt up to the railscape and make part of the, 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 the requirements that they have to do a buffer. Because I can't see a microbrewery going in on the corner of Harlem and, and um, Burlington with a, you know, whatever size, with an awning looking out onto the railroad tracks. And that's what your view is when you're, when you're sitting outside or, or any, any restaurant that we want to have outdoor dining. It just, it just seems like we're promoting the wrong visual effect. I mean, I don't, I don't want to sit there and eat, eat my pizza and have diesel dust on it. Um, I'm just wondering if we can, if that makes any sense to anybody, that we treat that area completely different than we do the rest of the area. I don't even know if we can do that. You can. Well, I'd just like to say that makes a lot of sense to me. I like the idea. Um, if we do something like that, it might necessitate that we go back and look at the um, requirements that are in this draft regarding um, references to front yards and side yards and things of that nature as it pertains to outdoor dining. So, like, I'm noticing that in the standards, it looks like there are, is zero requirement for any front yard. So the minimum front yard, there just isn't a minimum. You, it could be zero. But then I also did notice some um, references in outdoor dining that everything refers to an additional um, five feet being tacked on to the front yard maximum of five feet, but there's no, there, there isn't a minimum. So you can add on five feet to nothing and then wind up with five feet, but it's in reference to a front yard and not a side yard or a rear yard, which if you wanna add more flexibility to have a railscape and railscape development, you need to revisit those concepts. So I think we have kind of a consensus. So if you could, if we could do a little bit of research on that, maybe try to get legal to give us some sort of parameters that we can work with, something mm -hmm. that's legal. Uh, sure. Go ahead, Trustee Powell. Can you state the consensus? I didn't hear a consensus. <laughs> um, cool. Yes. Consensus for what? To train. put a railscape, t railscape overlay by the train station, by the train tracks. That would encompass. I would think it would encompass, and I can be. I could. I could. I could. We, this is part of the discussion, but I would think Burlington to Quincy, Harlem to Delaplane. Yeah, okay. And if if, 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 if that, that pleases everybody, we'll let them. We'll stop here and come back with some answers. Yes. Um, there was one point that I didn't. Um, that occurred to me that I didn't raise earlier. Uh, with reference to the electric charging stations. Mm -hmm. um, there was a recommendation by the Preservation Commission that there be Preservation Commission review yes. over that, and I would like to see that happen. Yes. So um, if we could um, just clean up, there's a little bit of ambiguity in the uh, section as drafted. Uh, in its introduction to 10.810, it seems to uh, only be referring to a permitting process for the installation of public electric vehicle charging stations, but then the rest of the text goes on to talk about both 
private and residential, and then things that would be happening on public land. Mm -hmm. So I think we just need to uh, clarify. <coughs> I think we're eliminating public if we want to also dictate what's you know being installed on private property. But then maybe it could be as simple as adding uh, a reference at the back to um, compliance with other regulations, including Village of Riverside Preservation Code requirements. Only on public land, correct? Um, no, I think to the extent that a um, landmarked property, whether it be residential or commercial, since we have both, wanted to install a um, piece of hardscape, basically, you know, on their property, it's, if it's, you know, something that would be visible from the public right away, they'd have to get a permit for it. Any landmark already has to go through a certificate of appropriate process with the um, Preservation Commission. So this would be the same thing. They would just look at it. So it would be public or private landmark? Because, I, I mean, if I, I'm going to put a charging station <coughs> here, I'm going to put a 240 outlet in my garage. I don't see why I need to have preservation tell me I can do that or not. I, I can see if I'm going to put it in a parking lot. Yes, that's correct. So it would be anything on the exterior. So it would it would have to be it would have to be something that would be that would trigger right. the certificate of appropriateness to begin with. Okay. So why don't we why don't we just why don't you circle with Charlie? because that was one of the recommendations he put in and maybe get some clarity. You, you could just say that it would follow certificate of appropriateness standards, which I think mm -hmm. would, it's then mm -hmm. it's any landmark, right. public or private building has mm -hmm. to be on the exterior. So like an example is if someone's upgrading their electrical inside their home, preservation doesn't opine right. on that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. that, it, I just wanna make sure we're yeah. clear on that. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that, was my, uh, right. that was my intent with that one. And then with respect to anything that's in, um, on public land, that's the public right of way, um, you know, I don't know, I, I think that there should probably just given how um, some of these uh, charging stations can be a little bulky or, um, you know, potentially unsightly, some of them have, you know, flashing displays with <coughs> advertisements and things like that. Um, if it's going on public land, uh, and then it's also in the, um, I think it's the B1 or the B2, it, there's, there is a problem with the current definition of hardscape in our code, because first of all, it doesn't include electric vehicles, but even if it did, the way that this is written, you could put in, an electric vehicle charging station anywhere on public land without Preservation Commission review because it being in the B1 or B2, which is under discussion, it's exempted. So, I mean, staff has been very good, I think, in uh, recent years about when there is a hardscape um, change being proposed that does, you know, it, go on public land, you know, they've just been really good about going to preservation and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And that's wonderful, and that's great, but there's nothing in our code that really requires that. So I would. I think those are good points. Why don't we get a little more definition from preservation on how they would like to have that written? Because you're right, I, we don't want to. I mean, I've seen some charges that have, you know, advertisements flashing all over it, and we wouldn't probably want to have that well, those, are, yeah. those are usually the ones where they are, you know, privately owned. We would own ours. I, well, I believe that that would yeah. be the direction of the, bone, of the board where we would own ours, and so therefore you wouldn't necessarily have that hurt. Okay. okay. Thank you. Does everyone agree that maybe this is a good spot to park it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ashley, thank you very much. I know you've only been here for a year and you've had to go back three years. So um, uh, your answers were outstanding and I appreciate all the work you've done and I appreciate all the work steering committee and the PZC's done because we only did a, an eighth of it and it's mind numbing. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay. Thanks, Ashley. All right. Um, speaking of mind numbing, um, we have a uh, discussion of recommended fiscal year 2023 budget, Director Johnson. Good evening again. Tonight I have provided you a draft 2023 budget starting on page 120 of your board packet. Staff started this budget process with the board, board in September with the 10-year capital improvement plan and the five-year financial forecast earlier this October. Staff is happy to present a balanced general fund budget for the board to review tonight. This budget is available at the front desk for public inspection. Staff has seen revenues continue to be strong after decreases in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The 2023 general fund revenues total $10,898,595, which is a decrease of approximately 1.2 million or 10% from 2022 projected year end. This decrease is due to several large one-time revenue streams in 2022, including um, insurance reimbursement from the June storm, ARPA funding, and um, two $100,000 grants for the fire and police department. 2022 was also a strong year in municipal sales tax collection and state per capita funds collection, and we expect this trend to continue. I did want to mention that 2022 property tax collections have been sluggish due to the, Cook, the delay in Cook County's second installment of property tax. I did receive notice late this afternoon that the village should receive the final extension figures between November 1st and November 11th with bills going out to property owners by the end of November. One additional item that staff would like direction on tonight that may have an impact on future year property tax levies is the historic preservation tax freeze program. I put in front of you tonight, tonight at your stations a copy of the agenda history sheet from January 22 when the board opted out of this program. The Preservation Commission has recommended that the village not opt out of this program. Would the board like me to go over the historic preservation property tax freeze program a little bit more? If, if I may, what preservation stated, this is going to be on their work plan because um, they feel that it's very important. Um, they did have a meeting last Thursday. I was in attendance um, and they had asked, you know, the village board, we don't know who will even opt into this program because of the standards of Department Interior are so rigorous that most people will do a cost benefit analysis and decide it's not worth it. Um, and Chairperson Pipel said that he himself has helped people with that kind of analysis and they've opted not to do it because it becomes cost prohibitive. Um, what they have asked is just try it for one year, don't opt out next year, try it, see if anybody does opt to do it, and then at least you have some sort of analytics. So, and the one thing that I would say is, remember, we're approximately, we're just shy of 16% of the tax bill. All the other taxing bodies already are part of this program. So now we're talking about basically our 15% our and it wouldn't change what our levy is. It would just kind of freeze their EAV for that period of time um, that they were eligible for the program. And how long is the, how long do you get the freeze? It's frozen for eight years and then it incrementally increases from year eight to 12. Okay. I, I, you know, I just, I just remember some of the conversations before and I don't know whether these are valid or not, but it, some of the reasons that people said is because most structures in Riverside are part of the, part of the historic, anything built after Aberdeen, you know better than I, 1952 or something, 1972? It's uh, 50. Two, I believe. So any of those properties would be eligible to do something like this. I don't know the criteria. I would like to hear. I would like to hear from preservation. I'd like you know that they, they would give us that. So is that on their agenda? They they just the, it's on their work plan. The, what their comment was as part of their work plan discussion was 
we don't even know that the, the, it's the unknown that anybody is even going to do right. it because it's so expensive and the process is so rigorous. So they, I think the question is, is there a consensus on the board that we'd like to try this for 2023? I would, and the reason that I would is because, um, you know, as, as uh, Manager Francis indicated, the standards for the work um, are exceedingly high. And it does take uh, approval of the State Historic Preservation Agency, you know, with the recommendation of the Preservation Commission to have your project approved. So it has to be something that is impacting the structural integrity of the building. Um, it has to be um, a physical improvement. Uh, it can't be, you know, things like landscaping or uh, accessory structures like garages. Um, so it all the really, stuff you've done over the last all the stuff days. that I've done, <laughs> right? Personally, would not be eligible. Um, so there's no conflict. Um, but either way, no, I, I really do think it can make the difference in terms of a quality restoration on a historic property um, if people challenge themselves to do the work and do it correctly. And it's expensive. It is not owning one of these, you know, homes, even if it is, you know, what you would consider a later you know, um, mid-century home. If you're going to do it correctly and you're going to do it to the Secretary of the Interior standards, you know, it is not a Home Depot job. Okay. So, Mr. Mr. Hannon? Yeah. Obviously, my understanding of this is not as deep as Trustee Marshaz goes, but, you know, my understanding is you're, this is not your typical rehabilitation. This is not redoing your kitchen. This is not, this is, you know, finding reclamated wood from wherever and recreating what was there. I mean, this is, this is a expensive proposition. And, you know, the people who can benefit from this in the village, you know, is not your everyday person. It's gonna be the two or three who are taking on this major renovation and doing it top of the line. So I, I don't see, the benefit in changing course, um, you know, the, the rationale of let's see who actually does it or if anyone does it, doesn't sway me. I mean, we've rejected it in the past. Um, it's not a public benefit to a majority of our residents. So I, I, I just, why have the experiment? Why create confusion? Why have people think they can apply for it, spend resources and realize this is a wealthy person's folly to pursue? Anyone on this side? Yes, Ms. Evans. Did somebody ask for us to consider this? Preservation. It comes up every Preservation. Year. And this time they wanted to. They, they've made presentations to the board in the past, but because they knew we were planning for fiscal year 2023, they felt it wasn't an appropriate time. They will put it in their, their work plan as well. We've had State Historic Preservation Office also come out and do a presentation several years back with regard to it, so. Yeah, let's, let's try it for a year. Mr. Pollack? I, I don't have a strong feeling on whether we should try it or not. I'm willing to try it if that's the consensus. Uh, but I do wanna kind of put it in perspective. Um, the reason that the law allows this is because some people do think it's a public benefit when people preserve and enhance historical structures. And that's basically what it comes down to is do we provide a subsidy to encourage uh, historic preservation uh, at the expense of every other taxpayer in the village? Because, you know, whatever they don't pay, someone else pays. Could just be pennies, but nonetheless. And so it's really, a, a you know, I, I, I don't think it's going to make a difference. I don't think it's going to move the needle on the side either direction. Um, but I just want to, you know, in case that helped you decide how you want to proceed, um, that's the philosophy behind it, agree or disagree with that, but. Okay, so I got, I got one, two yeses, one no, and, and one explanation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I need something here. Uh, I, I largely agree with Trustee Pollock. I'm not sure it's going to make a difference. I, I, um, 
I am troubled by the optics of it. And so my, I don't feel strongly either way, but my preference would probably be to stay the course where we are now. Same. Stay the course. strongly either way. But. So that gives me three stay the courses. Two, they want to do it, and one explanation. Four, because I said I'd go with the consensus. Okay, four stay the courses, <laughs> so no. Okay. Thank you. We will provide that opt-out ordinance in January. <coughs> um, general fund expenditures total eleven million four hundred. Sorry, eleven million seven hundred and fourteen thousand two hundred and eighty-four thousand, an increase of one hundred and forty-eight thousand, or one point two nine percent. The total net surplus in the general fund is one hundred and fifty-three thousand nine hundred and ninety-five with an unassigned fund balance estimated to increase $16,246. Oh, okay. Um, wanted to note a couple notable changes in general fund expenditures in 2023 that include the addition of two additional police officers for transition purposes, the addition of one new general maintenance staff member in the public works department, the addition of an in-house engineer, and an estimated large increase in the fire department paramedic contract. <clears throat> the parking lot fund currently shows a deficit for 2022 year end projection and a 2023 and a deficit in the 2023 budget due to the decreased parking revenue derived from parking lot one. And this deficit grows due to the budgeted 90,000 for an electric vehicle charging station in 2023. I wanted to follow up on some discussion from previous meetings and get some board direction on if the EV charging station is installed on village property, would the board like the general fund unassigned or capital projects fund to subsidize the capital expenditure? Given that the board wants this to be an economic driver and to remain competitive in the electronic, in electric charging, state, charging rates, Staff recommends the capital outlay be funded by the Capital Projects Fund. Thank you. And that's only if, correct? This is, this is not, we're not saying we're gonna do this. Again, we're, we have several irons in the fire between public, private grants and stuff like that. But if, correct. at the this end is of the day- if we, we build have, this on village, in a village parking lot. Okay, I think if, that makes if, sense. If I'm in favor of it. Okay, yes, it's, it's an if. We're always gonna get a second bite. Flexibility, my friend. <laughs> Everybody good, Mr. Pollock? I, I'm fine with that, and but also, as we I think we discussed before, we haven't decided if it's going to be 100% paid for by users or if we're going to subsidize it. My preference, I think, is that it gets paid for by users over time. But I, I would agree. I don't want to like, yeah, lose that, sight of that. It's yeah. I, I I have never been to one that's on a public property where it's free. It's going to be attached to an Amazon or attached to somebody that wants you to visit. And that's, that's yeah, so I, I agree with hold, that. Hold on. That, and then we do have a follow-up question. Because then you're saying you want capital projects to pay for it, but then you want then the, the user rates to pay for it over time? Because then, then that changes what the rate is that we would be charging. I actually... Um, slightly disagree with the concept of, you know, having the users pay for it initially. Um, I think part of our motivation in deciding that we wanted to put one of these in in the Central Business District was to entice people down there and to bring them there and to get them in. And um, as far as I know from most of my friends who have MBAs, you know, the concept is you get the people hooked on using a product and coming to your downtown to park here because you have the free electric charger for a period of time. And once they've grown to love our businesses and make it a habit of coming to Riverside for all of their, you know, commercial needs, um, then you can consider raising the rates a couple years down the road. Like, again, I think that conversation is the conversation when we get to when the if becomes a when um so then we can we can because there's there's also we can do lease agreements we can do all of kinds course. of other things we of don't course. know Absolutely. all the different things so but i just i just kind of wanted to put that out there Appreciate that it wasn't that. entirely a so this is more of where we gonna where the money's going to come from and, and i think mr hannah did you have anything i do not okay thank you 
You got what you want? Yes, I will budget in a transfer from the general fund to offset that capital purchase in 2022. Okay. Or, sorry, in 2023. The water and sewer fund currently budgeted at a deficit of $1,586,458. This fund balance will be is a planned deficit for include including large capital projects, including the Shenstone water main and sewer upsizing project. This budget also includes one new water sewer employee for preventative maintenance, um, as well as capital depreciation. This budget also includes a $20,000 in sustainable building incentives, um, which there is a, a memo provided uh, at the back of the packet. It, if there's any questions upon that, um, Assistant Village Manager Monroe can help walk us through that. Um, this is usually where Doug tells us about the fact that the water sewer fund is an enterprise fund and that, that even though it's a, de it's a deficit, it comes back with user fees. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you were there. Um, you know, the sustainability initiative, I, I, I like that. Um, and when you and I talked about it, you told me something that I didn't even think about. If somebody puts a permeable driveway in and then a year later puts in a cement patio, they, they've net zeroed the, 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 the thing. So how, how do, we, do, we, do we, how do we make sure that that doesn't happen, that we keep their permeable at, a, at, a, at the rate of what we want it to stay at? If this type of program is what the board is looking for, we would bring back a program analysis for policy for the board to adopt that would have um, certain features in there so to kind of close those loopholes. We could flag it in our system to say that you would have to keep that lower impervious surface for, for three years, for five years. Um, we could research what other villages are doing, and then we would flag it to see in future permit applications to make sure that they're not increasing that impervious surface after they've received the incentive. Okay. The other thing that I've, I've learned is when you put in a, a, a dry well or, or one of these things that if, there's no, if there's, there's no way for this to percolate out, all you're doing is building an underground swimming pool. Um, so, uh, you, you know, is, can we tie a percolation rate, you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? To, to, to make sure that what we're giving is actually going to produce the end result that we need? Uh, we would probably need our, our village engineer to weigh in on and exactly what that rate would need to be or what type of structures. I mean, okay. yeah, I mean, I mean, we certainly could create any parameters that we felt were appropriate to address the concerns about stormwater either building up and pooling in people's yards or um, overloading our, our infrastructure and systems. So um, yeah, we can put any parameters in terms of the time, the time frame or, or other factors as to the type of build that we would require. Right, but if I understand that's really not the question, you, you're gonna go ahead and do all that stuff. Your question is to us is, do we feel that a twenty that we're willing to invest twenty thousand dollars into some sort of sustainability program as a rebate program to the to the residents as and and staff will will bring back a policy that will will follow it. Is that I'd like to take a look at that, yeah. Everybody okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I would like to know as part of that policy building were the the items that were initially proposed in terms of permeable surface types or, or other things, we use those as illustrative examples for driveway or patio, but are those the type of, of projects that would be acceptable to introduce as a part of this any, program? Any, I think any project that will alleviate water runoff into our sewer system. Okay. And I would, I would, Personally, I would say that short of, I mean, I, I think people, we need to start telling people to cut their gutters out of the, out of the underground sewers. I mean, we just need to start doing that. And we have a policy that, we don't have a policy that says you have to do it, but I know other villages yeah. say, mm -hmm. you got five years to do it. And that's something I think mm -hmm. we should look at also. 
Okay. I'm sorry? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's my brief synopsis of the proposed 2023 budget. Um, all the department heads are also here. Well, they were here tonight. Um, if there's any questions about any details, we're happy to um, help provide it, any insight. Um, just one. Um, we didn't really talk about the discussion of utilizing places of eating taxes from their, our central business district to reinvest in our central business district. Do you need direction on that? or? That's, that's in my next steps. Oh, I'm sorry. Um. I, thought you were, I thought you were finishing. <laughs> no, I'm opening it up for oh, okay. questions first. You're opening first. up more. Okay. Uh, but um, the next steps in this budget process um, will be at the November 17th board meeting okay. to present any minor adjustment in fees, um, to bring back the discussion of parking lot fees and BNSF contract adjustments, um, a little bit more discussion on the vehicle sticker program um, and, and timing of that program in the future months or in the future years. Um, a discussion of utilizing places for eating tax from the central businesses, um, sorry, from the restaurants in the central business district to reinvest in the central business district. Um, the request of further discussion on the IRMA deductible analysis and discussion of part-time health insurance rates. I'm sorry, I didn't see that at the November 17th, 2022. Mm -hmm. So, all right, very good. If there's no questions, um, the estimated final adoption of this budget will be December 1st, 2022. Um, I'm not anticipating um, changes based on the, the November 17th meeting. The only anticipated changes that we may have are um, as we continue the year, any capital projects that were budgeted for 2022 that may not be completed would be rolled over in 2023 and the board would be provided a detailed list of that with final adoption. Thank you. Any questions, anyone? Karen, thank you very much. Thank you. Very well done. I like your typewriter dress too. <laughs> um, we move on to trustee reports and communications. Do we have any? Aberdeen? Oh, well, let Alex no. go first, because yours is probably first. Because you're a tough act to follow, really. <laughs> uh, well, I have some good news, and I have some not so good news. <laughs> but then I also have more good news. So the good news is that this weekend is going to be a beautiful weekend. It'll be in the 70s. It is the uh, most picturesque type of foliage we'll have in our, in our area. So I would encourage anyone who loves nature to get out there, take photographs. We will have the final kayaking rentals available for families to enjoy. Um, and, and it's, it's going to be a really beautiful site for anyone who wants to get out there and take some, some pho photography. Not so good news is that shortly after that, we will return to cold weather. But we also have a very nice cold weather event that everyone loves to enjoy, and that is a holiday stroll. So I will ask everyone to save the date for December 2nd. The Chamber of Commerce is planning on having that um, return this year. Uh, there's a lot of challenges ahead, but there's a lot of community organizations who are stepping forward to help out the Chamber get this event underway for everyone to enjoy. Uh, the Illinois Police Association will have a toy drive. Uh, Lions Club is stepping forward. Uh, businesses are getting excited to, to offer um, all the families some enjoyment. So that will be something to look forward to. Until then, happy Halloween. Thank you. And Aberdeen, where's, where's Big Head Fred been? Oh, where is Big Head Fred been? Okay, this week, uh, Big Head Fred has been visiting um, our area schools. So he was at uh, Ames on Wednesday. He was at, um, let's see, oh wait, Ames Tuesday. Uh, he was at Hollywood Wednesday. He was at um, Central this morning, and tomorrow morning he's going to Blythe Park. Next week, He's going to St. Mary's uh, on Wednesday and then Hauser on Friday. And we'll be at the Riverside Public Library also on Wednesday following his appearance at uh, St. Mary. Also, um, just wanted to put in a little uh, plug for the last uh, Olmstead Society walking tour of the year, which is Sunday, the 30th of October at 2 p.m. at the train station. Uh, they will be covering the first division.
portion of our lovely village. Um, the next day, as mentioned, is Halloween. So I want to wish everybody a safe and happy one. Um, in addition, I'm going to put in a little plug for um, the Teal Pumpkin Project, which is for children who have food allergies. Uh, there is a map available online at um, foodallergy.org where you can put in your address if you're going to be um, giving away non-food treats for our kiddos who have you know, allergies and other uh, sensory issues. So you don't actually have to put your uh, address in there. You could just put out a little teal pumpkin to alert people that you have this, and um, that would be great. But anyway, enjoy. Thank you. And we, I've been following Fred on Facebook. He's, oh, have you? Yes, he's been at every business and all over, so yeah. very nice. We appreciate you bringing him to town. Any other reports? OK. Um, the board does not have a need for an executive session this evening, so I would ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Trustee Gallego. Second? Second. Second by Trustee Marshazga. Um, Ethan, if you'd please call the roll. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallego. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Trustee Marshazga. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody.